Thank you very much. I'm very excited that today has arrived. Um, so we're going to continue with our, our panel session. And all the participants will investigate the roles of media, social technology, civic leadership, and diverse business models within the architectural industry. We define the architectural industry as a professional industry surrounding the design, coordination, and realization of architecture from a conceptual idea to a built form. The industry is comprised of the future architects, architects and professionals that contribute to bringing architecture to the mainstream society. So as we've mentioned earlier today, our main themes are, yes, the social media and the new business models. Um, and the participants in our panel today are representative of those themes. Our first panelist is Annabelle Seldorf, who is the founder and principal of Seldorf Architects. She is our example of a seasoned professional. We have more. <laughs> not a, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> that's not, <laughs> it's a very good thing. <laughs> we, <laughs> we have uh, Mark Kushner, who is the principal of HWKN and the CEO of Architizer, an example of an entrepreneur, an architectural firm, and a social media network. Ilya Azarov, who is an award-winning artist and architect. He also has a firm, uh, Plus Lab Architects, that is a new business model. We have Molly Height, from is the contributing editor of the Architects newspaper and the managing director, Superscript. We have David Faino, the partner of Case Incorporated. He's going to bring the idea of Case's building model and AEC services. Nathan Miller, a director at Case, will bring the idea of computational design technology on design practice. And Yan Ha, the founder of Front Studio, another example of a new business model. And I'm very happy and honored to have the new practices co-chairs as my moderators who have also helped me develop this panel. Uh, Philip Von Dawig, of the principal of Manfold Architecture Studio, AIA Lead AP, and Christopher Leong, Associate AIA of Leong Leong. And now I'd like to continue and they'll start their presentations. Those seasoned ones, we don't know how to deal with modern technology. <laughs> I have others to do that for me. <laughs> so the next one goes up. Okay. All right. Here you see a seasoned studio. We started it. <laughs> the sad reality, it's true. I've been doing this for a mighty long time. Um, so... I just quickly wanted to run through a few projects. Uh, you'll see very much that we're not very future oriented, but um, we keep our heads down to our tables and um, see how we can develop architecture along the way. Um, this is <clears throat> just an introduction to show the different kinds of projects we're doing. This is one of the oldest ones. In fact, it doesn't exist anymore. It was a gallery um, Michael Werner Gallery on 67th Street that we did in around 1910. <laughs> <laughs> At least I can get a laugh out of you. Um, but this is by way of introduction that a big part of my practice has been uh, doing art and art related projects. We do a lot of uh, galleries, contemporary, old master, um, museums, museum spaces. In fact, we were very lucky, privileged to work on the Carrere and Hastings building for the Neue Galerie New York, 
uh, Museum for German and Austrian Art, <clears throat> you can imagine that I was the perfect candidate for it, being that I'm German, as undoubtedly you heard. Um, and these are just some interior shots. That was a wonderful project because it brought together an opportunity to insert a new kind of uh, activity in a building that was originally designed to be um, a very posh home for the Miller family. And making it into a museum and turning it into a museum where there are all sorts of demands on lighting and HVAC systems and making it part restoration, part renovation, inserting a design philosophy that is one of restraint um, and respect uh, was a particular challenge and great pleasure for me. Uh, for example, here the lit ceiling is obviously something that didn't exist before, but it's reminiscent of the secession building in Vienna. And there is something sort of interesting to understand about the, the period of the art that's exhibited here that is simultaneous to the period that the building was built and inspires reflections on how culture and precedence travels. Um, another art project is David Zwerner Gallery. Um, three adjacent galleries that in the course of time we renovated, linked, uh, and built out the space for. Uh, a gallery building on 21st Street for Barbara Gladstone. Um, very ambitious uh, space and it was a wonderful opportunity to actually build a new building in the Chelsea art area. One that is inspired by daylight. Um, we're currently working on a project in London, which will open, I think, the week after next. Uh, it's a tent structure for freeze masters. Um, it'll only be there for about a week, but it took a lot more than a week to think about it. Um, and here are some residential spaces, just to give you an impression what the work we do look like. We do old and new, prefer the new, but inspired by the old. Uh, this is a building I'm particularly proud of, a house I'm particularly proud of. Um, it's a five-story little tower that some people say it reminds them of a mining tower. For me, it's the Seagram in Colorado. Um, and it was an interesting house to build because uh, normally you wouldn't be allowed to build buildings that are more than three stories tall. But in this particular, I think it's one of the very few uh, areas of America that zoning code doesn't exist. Uh, some details. It's a pretty, and the views, which I wasn't that responsible for. <laughs> Took a while to deal with those mountains, I tell you. Um, we're currently working on another project that is uh, not exactly residential, though um, they're all houses. We're working on a resort villa program. Uh, the resort is called Amangiri, and it's located in Utah, uh, near Lake Powell, if you're familiar with the area. And um, it's adjacent to a hotel resort, and the villa program consists of 37 villas. And this is the first prototype that was completed recently. Again, I wasn't at all responsible for the mountains around it. Um, we've worked on a number of apartment buildings, uh, some here in New York City. This is one located in Chelsea on 19th Street. Um, and have developed a uh, particular like for using terracotta, which again uh, sort of links into my interest in precedent, of both in exploring materials um, and building technology. Another building, uh, another apartment building is 200 West 11th Street, which has a base made of terracotta and a stainless steel uh, tower portion. 
And what's particular distinctive about this building is that we introduced a car elevator. So if you bought an apartment in this building, you could bring your own or someone else's car uh, up to your floor and park it there. Yeah, people sort of laugh about that, but it's an interesting thing because it was really a fairly simple, straightforward idea being that there are plenty of storage buildings in the neighborhood where trucks go into the building to unload their goods. Um, however, passing through planning approval um, codes and safety devices was quite a feat and um, as such, this is still a fairly unique proposition. These are the spaces within. Um, I'm always very proud of tight, well thought out floor plans that address a sort of narrative about how people use space. And I think that's really what's central to our work. Um, a slightly different uh, kind of subject matter is we're lucky to work on a recycling facility in Brooklyn in Sunset Park, um, which is in mid-construction right now. Um, this is a facility where uh, metal, glass, and plastic is delivered to the site in barge, rail, or truck, um, where it's sorted and repackaged and sent away. And there is also a, a visitor center, which is part of the facility. I hope you'll come and see it when it's done. It's really a pretty spectacular site uh, and a unique proposition which I think will uh, revolutionize the way we think about recycling in New York City. This is exclusively for municipal recycling and is a collaboration between the sanitation department and Sims Metal Management. A project in size uh, far larger than anything that we have done and different in scope in as much as uh, when you're dealing with industrial buildings, you not only have to understand the processes that happen within, but at the same time, um, there are sort of considerations of master planning. And again, at the very end, it's all about how space is utilized. Um, yeah, these are some early construction pictures. That's it. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> and I've gotten mighty old while I'm at it. As a side note, um, it's a three-minute, um, ten-slide um, presentation. So, I'm Mark Kushner. Uh, I'll give you my entire professional history in three minutes and nine slides. Um, so, I, I kind of wear two hats, and I think I'm wearing two hats on this panel today. I'm a practicing architect, a founder and principal at HWKN, and also uh, the CEO and co-founder of Architizer. So HWKN, uh, this was the very first project that uh, Matthias, my partner, and I did together. thought it was a good thing to show today because it was about the future. And it was the notion of how sky skyscrapers of the future will look uh, and perform in a wetter world. And that notion kind of informs the trajectory of HWKN. This was six years ago. Um, always reaching for a big idea and finding how architecture can grapple with and communicate these larger ideas that are facing society and, and culture. Uh, this is a project that we did for BMW for uh, their Mini Cooper brand. We did this in September of 2008, and then uh, like literally the day it came down, it was a nine-day installation also, temporary. Uh, the world, economic world collapsed, and we found ourselves with a lot of free time uh, to pursue <laughs> Other projects like Architizer, this idea of using social media, what we were using in our private lives for dating and for keeping up with friends and for finding pictures online, 
um, that we should use that uh, new technology and there's new ways of communicating to help architects tell the world about what we do. We were endlessly frustrated as young architects being able to show people what we do, always going hat in hand to editors and magazines and saying, you know, please publish my whatever, skyscraper about a wetter world, uh, and getting nowhere. Uh, so Architizer came directly out of that frustration. Let's create a platform uh, where we create a, a powerful community that's able to attract attention from outside of our little echo chamber here. So Architizer now is about to turn three in November. Uh, almost 50,000 projects uploaded by people all over the world, 600,000 Facebook fans. Like, it's, it's great. It's growing, and it's awesome. Um, it's, our iPad app is pre-installed in every single iPad at every single Apple store in America. So like just that one victory for me is awesome. When you're going and shopping at these stores for the future of technology, architecture is right there and has a seat at the table. Um, one thing that we've done at architecture, Architizer that I'm particularly proud of is competitions that link architecture to these cultural phenomenons that are uh, affecting us in our daily lives. When gay marriage passed, uh, when, the, when it was legalized in New York, um, we hooked up with TheKnot.com, the biggest wedding uh, website around, and did a competition for a gay wedding chapel. Because for us, that was an architectural question. Here's a cultural phenomenon, society shifting, but what does a gay wedding chapel actually look like? That becomes an architecture question. And we thought it was our job as architizer to get up and slap people across the face and say, it's the spaces that you occupy that define these things. It's not the words and the legislation. It's the spaces and the artifacts that we build that will be the visual memory of these things. Um, the firm lives on and is, thank God, doing really well. This is a gelato factory that we opened about a year ago on Houston Street. Uh, this is the Pines Pavilion, which is under construction in, uh, uh, <laughs> this is July 4th when the drag queens come and it's called the invasion. Uh, this, is Fire <laughs> <laughs> this is Fire Island. Uh, it'll open this summer. And uh, this is a very big, will be the tallest uh, building in New Jersey when it's done uh, in uh, Jersey City. Uh, we're working on phase one right now and going through approvals. Um, and finally, this is Wendy, which was just installed and, well, it was just deinstalled last week at PS1. Uh, we were lucky enough to be the Young Architect uh, winners of the MoMA Young Architect program. Um, and this for us was really an encapsulation of those ideas of how do we get architecture to speak directly to people. And even that name, that name Wendy, that people were tweeting at architecture and saying, I'm going to hang out with Wendy this weekend. That, for us, was kind of a culmination of this exploration that we've been going through about how to get architecture out of here and out into the city. Future now. <laughs> Mark, that was great. It's um, actually great to uh, actually to say thank you to you. You made us the uh, firm of the week um, in the middle of the summer last year. And we didn't even have our website in full beta yet, and so we freaked out. So, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Ilya Azarov, and uh, I'm the founding uh, director of the PLUS Lab. And I just want to show you a little bit about who we are and, and what we do. Um, we are makers, primarily. We digitally fabricate um, and assemble on site. Um, we uh, engage with lots of different artists around the world. Uh, we pride ourselves on being great collaborators, working with um, people who work with video, lighting, um, fashion, dance, you name it. Um, we are also proud to be artists, architects, thinkers, and a good dose of what we do is experimentation. Uh, we often joke that the most valuable item we have in our office is the trash can because we fully experiment and throw things away more than we make. We fully engage in ephemera and hopefully provide a platform for what we think architecture is about, a reflection of culture 
and it will always accommodate the human body. As far as we go in the future, it's still about us, we, those, those, those creatures. And as I said, installation, we work with lots of museums. This is the Museum of Modern Art before they did the renovation. Um, and these moments are very much like the attention span that uh, we had heard about earlier on. This is one project that I will, will, will highlight. It's called The Changing Room. Uh, this is uh, an old shop down in Lower Manhattan that through, through uh, grants and collaborative efforts, um, a team of us was given this space. And we simply decided to turn it into a brief cultural space. We did five installations in five weeks invited musicians, artists, and performers. It was a beautiful event. And if that is not transformative, I don't know what is. But the best thing that came out of this was that every shop owner in Lower Manhattan within a two or three block radius came to this and thanked us after five weeks saying, my business increased. Uh, there was culture where there wasn't before and that increased foot traffic had an impact on people who perhaps didn't even visit the space. So these are some of the things that I asked before I started the studio, and we constantly ask all the time. If architecture is a reflection of culture, then what is the culture of our time? Because it redefines itself constantly. We ask it and talk about this in the office every week. The 21st century has no constant with the exception of change, and how do we embrace constant change instead of fear it? Society has an ever -shortened, shortened attention span, distraction. That's why we engage in ephemera. Reality and cyber reality are in a battle for our attention, so where shall we dwell? And that's a long, ongoing question. So with that, my last bit of this is, as part of today, we're going to be talking about studios. Years ago, I planned for my career to have three studios. My first studio was about collaboration called the Design Collective, which transformed into this new studio. I ran it for several years and really focused on building collaboration. And I did that. I've got a great support team. I can call people everywhere and get help or help them. This second studio, the Plus Lab, has been operating for just over two years. And it's about experimentation, digital fabrication, working with our hands, installations. And it is so exciting because the notion of master builder is something that is what architect means. And we in the 21st century can really own that again because we don't have to have the middle person. Whatever we think here can go directly into a building process that we fabricate and install ourselves at scale. I think that's powerful. So that's what I'm fascinated with, and that's the way we're currently running the office. But if I keep asking that question, what is the culture of our time, that will change. And so I don't know what the third iteration of my studio will be, and I don't know when that will occur. I guess only time will tell. Thank you. Hello, my name is Molly Heinz, and I'm an editor at the Architects newspaper and also the managing director of an editorial consultancy called Superscript, which is a new endeavor that I started with um, four colleagues from the design criticism program at SVA about a year and a half ago. And today I'm here to represent a media perspective on architecture and design, obviously, but um, uh, in doing this introduction, I actually thought what I would do is uh, raise a few issues um, that had been on my mind recently relative to writing, editing, and publishing both in print and online. And uh, I'm not an architect, so I don't have any pretty pictures to show you. I have more some provocations that maybe we can talk about uh, during the panel. Um, but all these issues are 
uh, ones that reflect, I think, how media is evolving and the kinds of problems and opportunities that that evolution raises for editors and readers. And the first is real estate. And by that, I don't mean Bruce Ratner real estate. I actually mean the real estate of the page. And at the Architects newspaper, we publish three editions of a print issue, the East, Midwest, and West. Um, East is twice a month, the Midwest and West are each once a month. And uh, within that uh, publication, we have news, uh, we have a feature, we have reviews and commentary. And it's a tabloid format. I think, uh, hopefully, some of you are familiar with it. And um, for every issue, there are many small decisions related to that real estate or where an article will go in the paper, um, what news is on the front page, uh, what articles are referenced in the abbreviated table of contents we also have on the front page. Um, now each front page is really a snapshot of where the editor's minds are at any given moment in time. Um, and as you, you may know, um, at the New York Times, for example, every day there's a page one meeting. They have a special page one conference room uh, to decide what's on the front and even what's above the fold, as they say. Um, but you know, what happens when you take all that online? There's a certain democratization that happens with that content. You lose the real estate. One story becomes as important as another. And at the Architects newspaper, we still distinguish between news stories and so-called blog posts. And um, in this slide on the, on the left side, you can see uh, our kind of news column feed. And on the right side, you can see our uh, so-called blog feed. And the blog stories are really info-driven, quick, short hits. Um, but so many readers consume through aggregators from uh, Google Reader um, to even more commonly today Twitter that those distinctions, um, even as you try to make them online, almost cease to matter because people go directly to the link, go directly to the story. So the only way a story stays at the top of the page or at the top of the heap is if it's constantly updated, which brings me to a second issue, which is reporting. Now, at the Architects newspaper, stories are researched and reported, uh, meaning that the writer's, writer has spoken with uh, key players in the story, hopefully people on both sides of the issue, or, um, in order to produce some original content, um, including uh, new perspective and quotes from the key players. But, but that takes time. And today in publishing, particularly online publishing, uh, time is quite a luxury. And the more posts you have online, the more traffic your website has. And the upshot of this is every day we're looking at a lot of recycled content. Um, often you can even trace a story's path as it moves from blog to blog. And um, I just hear, I, I was laughing yesterday when I saw this post um, on a kind of techie website called Pando Daily. And um, it's an editor who is uh, kind of uh, mocking another editor at a publication that's just announced it's actually going to do um, journalism on Fridays. Like if they're going to actually do reported stories one day of the week, rather than recycle every other day of the week. Um, you know, I think even, even worse, uh, content is now put up in what one might call the, uh, I might call it like, you know, you're in the decision making process of this might make for an interesting story, or that's where your mind is but you want to be the first to get it up there, so you go ahead and put it up without having necessarily done that kind of reporting um, that's traditional. And uh, what happens in that case is the journalistic process, the writing, editing, fact-checking, copy editing, is kind of all happening out there in public. And as a reader, if you happen to check in at the wrong point, you may take, uh, take away a half-baked story and then you know the internet kind of functions like this giant game of operator where did you hear this? No, I thought it was that. So um, it's uh, something that you know I think a lot of people who um, have kind of straddled the print and online worlds struggle with every day. Um, the last issue I wanted to talk about is uh, reciprocity and um, you know readers talking back and having conversations with editors. And I think really, surely this is the most kind of exciting evolution of journalism. And I think it's particularly exciting for the fields of architecture and design, where professionals can tend to talk amongst themselves. Um, you know, readers and users are now really talking back, commenting and engaging in dialogue, even engaging in funding projects through platforms like Kickstarter. 
And one project I'm involved with uh, through, through Superscript is something called ADBC, or the Architecture and Design Book Club. And uh, the idea for that was to get people, the general public, involved in conversations about design and um, through, through an accessible text, and uh, which in our case of the book club is often fiction, and then hold that event in a public space and um, you know, ideally entice people uh, that are just off the street to come in and join the conversation. And you know, given how the media landscape is transforming and what that enables, I think it's more important than ever for architects and people who write about architecture to go beyond the page, beyond the screen, and have conversations and debate with a broader public in real time and real space. Thanks. I'll try to make this fairly quick. I'm uh, Dave Fano. I'm a partner and essentially managing director at uh, Case. Uh, I also uh, answer the phones, do recruiting, sweep the floor, a little bit of everything. Uh, so, uh, just a bit of background on Case. It was started by myself and uh, two other guys trained as architects. Our background is we used to work at uh, Shop Architects and uh, really took a love to technology and how it affects how buildings go together. Um, so we decided to start a company four years ago that helps everybody in the AEC, architecture, engineering, construction, and owners uh, industry do that. And uh, we've grown over the last four years to about a 20-person firm mixed with uh, engineers, architects, designers, technologists, um, software developers, a uh, good healthy mix. We break down what we do into what we call our four key offerings, um, strategy, implementation, consulting, uh, and software. Um, strategies where we'll come in and help a firm think through how all these new tools and processes are affecting their business uh, and uh, workflow. Implementation is where we help a firm come in and actually start to use and do some of these things. Uh, consulting is when we actually take on some of that work. Uh, and then software is when, when we build things, uh, build tools. So four very fast case studies. Um, a firm like Array, specialized healthcare firm, uh, looking to implement BIM tools and work more efficiently. Uh, so we'll come in and help them think through that organizationally, assessment of all the technology, um, and then ultimately deliver a strategic plan uh, for how they might do those things. So fairly high level uh, type work. Then implementation is where we come in and then actually train and teach lots of the folks at Case, our teachers. I've been teaching at Columbia for about five years. Uh, Nate, who's going to talk in a minute, teaches at uh, University of Nebraska. Um, anyway, I'm not going to go through all of them, but anyways, we bring that to how we teach software to designers uh, and anyone involved in the industry and then putting in systems and um, making sure that that all goes off without a hitch and supporting it. Uh, and then if the problems get a little complex, um, we'll come in and do it ourselves. So project management and clash detection and did, did I miss something? Giggles? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm no definitely known for typos. Uh, <laughs> and then software development. Uh, you know, this is a case where we were brought on to build a, an asset management and asset tracking tool for a facility, a large hospital that was trying to use their models that they use for clash detection uh, to track them all and have QR codes on each you know piece of equipment within the building and being able to scan it with an iPad and a website and find out when the last time that piece of equipment was maintained. Uh, so things like that are some of the software we'll build. So we focused, uh, you know, we focused on technology and how it affects the industry. So looking forward to the panel discussion.
Hi, thank you for the, uh, uh, the invitation to the panel. We're, uh, both Dave and I are very happy to be here to talk a little bit about Case's work. I'm going to be talking a little bit more specifically about a, a couple of things that I'm interested in from the standpoint of computational design. Uh, before, I'm actually quite new to Case. Uh, I've been here for about, I've been with the, the company for now about three months. Uh, previous to this, I was uh, for five years a designer at an architecture firm called MBBJ um, and also kind of helped them lead and develop a lot of the computational design processes uh, that you'll kind of see examples of here today. Um, fundamentally, I'm concerned about um, this sort of relationship, sort of how, where, where does design thinking exist uh, in the world of automation? You know, how do these two things relate to each other? And I think there's a lot of anxiety right now about certain tools, processes, and techniques kind of going out of our control. How many times have we heard sort of the idea that, oh, I don't want to use Revit uh, because it doesn't allow me to be as free with my design. Um, I don't want to use that algorithm because it's going to control the design for me. I'm interested in computational design as sort of the design of processes that allow for architects, designers, engineers to begin to control and manipulate the automation of their own profession. Um, so I'm going to go through just a couple of very kind of quick uh, examples of, of what I mean by this. So this is a, you know, a, a tool uh, that I developed that looks at sort of early stage conceptual development of a master plan. Um, uh, you know, an array of perhaps 20 buildings, all of which with their own different FAR criteria. Architects are designing, are working with now problems that have a vast amount of complexity to them. And so by using kind of computational design processes, we can begin to uh, understand those complexities at a very early stage and begin to work within them and begin to use automation as sort of an extension of our ability to work through complex processes and problems. This kind of leads into the idea of the architect or the designer as a tool maker, the ability for us to begin to customize algorithmic processes, um, customize automation routines that begin to suit our ability to tackle the problems that we're interested in, to extend sort of aesthetic agenda, extend functional uh, requirements and such. And so this is an example of a Grasshopper plugin I developed. Uh, it's available for free, so you're all you know, welcome to go download it, install it, and you know, use it as a way to kind of uh, further uh, you know, different design problems. Simulation. Um, a lot of, you know, I've, I've experienced sort of comments like, oh, you know, simulation is, is going to kind of replace this idea of intuition. Um, that we no longer, you know, necessarily have to intuit spaces um, or kind of, you know, make guesses, but now we can allow these sort of tools to kind of, you know, uh, simulate and run through the problems in a more precise way. I think of simulation as being uh, an ability for us to extend our own intuition our ability to sort of make guesses and then create processes and procedures that allow us to then validate those decisions in a very real way and kind of help us work through problems. Um, one of the uh, you know things that I think that we we often take for granted um, in in the process is this idea of interoperability. We are using tools now that uh, you know have sort of their own mathematical frameworks, their own underlying structure, and how they handle data. Um, you know, Rhino is structured very differently from Revit. Um, AutoCAD, you know, operates differently uh, than a BIM modeler. Um, you know, there's, there's all these sort of differences, and the idea here is that by kind of designing processes, we're able to sort of bridge those things together and begin to use and, and uh, use tools together in new and different ways. Um, and then that kind of leads into the discussion about being able to design your own workflow. So using computation is not a way to, not necessarily a way to sort of design a building or design uh, sort of the end result, but use it as sort of a process that allows you to sort of manage the entire spectrum of information from the initial concept to the sort of the, the end deliverable in sort of a, a seamless way. So using uh, the design of the, the, the overall sort of information driven process as, as sort of part of the kind of the, the way an ar architect operates. I think there's like, you know, there's various varying degrees of statistics around this that 20% to 25% of our time when we're dealing with design issues, um, when we're sort of in production is spent on moving information, not generating content. So there's a whole sort of section of our process that can, can, can begin to be accommodated by this. So follow me on Twitter. <laughs>
I'm now going to attempt to summarize everyone's presentation through Front Studio, which I'm Yen Ha. Front Studio is a firm that I started in 2001. This was our first office. Um, our, the firm is, is balanced sort of between producing architecture that is based on a more traditional model, where it's context-based, whether that's historical context or programmatic context. Um, so we're working on projects that look like this. And then we're also generating projects that are more about the urban context and our responsibility as architects to shaping our environment and you know, thinking about how people use the environment. I don't remember what slides I put next. Okay, so then, um, so the, the firm started, we, for probably five or six years, uh, we were, were a small design practice, and we're, so we're working on projects you know, that have to do with how we're, we're making an idea for a space, maybe a very small space. Um, and then we, we joined a firm in Pittsburgh, one of my former professors, whose firm was producing work like this. And then we started thinking about voice and what our voice is and how do we actually merge those two ideas of a firm that is building buildings and a, and a design studio that is making you know, small spaces or urban interventions. And how do we make that all into one authentic voice that captures everyone, all of us? And, and how does it work in a way that feels genuine to the person who is viewing you know, what our new firm is? Um, so you can see that you know when we're working on the website, we needed to make a palette that could then encompass all of those different types of architecture, ideas, creation, um, from you know like a single-story freestanding building to a residential complex to a single home in the outskirts of Pennsylvania. We were looking for an idea that would enable us to show projects like Farmadelphia and then uh, a mixed-use project which is, just got built in, outside of Pittsburgh. And then we start talking about more about voice and social media and how do we start integrating the culture of the firm out into what is visible and you know a lot of what happens but with social media is they tell you oh start a blog you need to have a twitter account you need to really get out there so people can kind of see you but how do you do that in a way that is your voice that feels authentic to you um, for us in new york we started a lunch studio blog instead of an architecture blog because it felt like something that we could genuinely every day say something relevant say something that meant something and not not just trying to market our projects or market the actual architecture, but sort of market the culture of what our firm is about and what we believe in and this one aspect which happens to be about food. Um, but we still needed to incorporate some of the larger aspects of the firm into it. And so we've been working very loosely on a Tumblr thing, blog, whatever it's called, where, <laughs> where we can sort of have a lot of disparate ideas and, and anyone who's part of the studio can then just contribute to it. It's not it's not about whether it's built work or things that we're doing, but you can show hand drawings with exploded axon sections, you know, with renderings, and that, that whole palette can start to inform what Front Studio is about in a way that is really genuine to the people who are part of the studio. So that's where we are now. <laughs>